بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم ما بعد today we are going to uh, discuss uh, the uh, next scholar in the series of uh, scholars of islamic economic thought um, today's a uh, scholar is um, nizam al mulk at tusri um there are quite interesting uh, points that actually we can see uh, through his uh, scholarship uh, he was not only the scholar uh basically he was a uh, administrator uh the one who became the uh, joint minister then later he became the prime minister which we call wazir of seljuk dynasty um so i think today uh, uh we hope we can cover uh the entire chapter of his uh, his book as well uh, which is uh, siyasat nama so we uh, divide our discussion into three the first one is um we going to talk about his himself and his background uh his uh, historical background as well uh what was the year and everything and then what was the uh, political dynasty that he was going through um when things happened uh what are the impact that he, that 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 time was happening around uh, so this is the first part of the discussion then we will discuss on his work uh especially the major works that he has done especially in the uh, uh, uh political economy uh then we will discuss into number 3 we will discuss into his uh economic thought uh, there are various uh, points uh, that we, we we actually can discuss and also uh, finally we actually uh, will discuss on what is the uh, legacy that he left and uh, until today we are actually following something which belongs to him uh, we will discuss all this uh, in today's class yeah inshallah uh, so um, about him the first discussion uh, his name uh, was khwaja abu ali hasan ibn ali ishaq um uh, i think uh, you know the uh, the name uh, you heard the name khwaja i think the name uh, most probably uh, this is a quite famous name in subcontinent as well especially in uh, iran afghanistan lahore pakistan india bangladesh um, so uh, i think this, he is the first person that i know uh, in the time in the in the history of time i think uh, uh, i think this is the first next first scholar uh, that i come to know that having the name of khwaja um because uh, he is uh, from the 5th century uh if not i could, i could say it's, it's very close to also 4th century uh, of hijri's scholar so um, uh, we call him nizam al mulk uh tusi so the word tusi is actually his birthplace uh is is actually is located in uh, in somewhere in iran um it is in the small town called uh, radhan uh it comes within the suburb of tus it's uh, it's uh, is 50 miles uh, uh, it's it's 50 miles of north of mashhad in persia uh so um so basically he he is basically he was a persian um uh, but 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 that, uh, he was born in 408 which is corresponding to 1017 uh, miladi uh, uh, his father was appointed as a tax collector of tus um, by the governor of khurasan his name is abu al fadl suri uh, so basically the uh, idea of uh, his father being a uh, uh, tax collector 
the father was not actually the um, uh, was appointed by uh, by by the 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 government which appointed later which appointed uh, nizam al mulk i mean khawaja abu ali hasan so meaning to say that um, uh, uh, there was a different dynasty uh, 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 by the way you need to understand this as well this is the time that we are talking about uh, we are going now into fifth hijri right so you see we talked about abu yusuf abu ubaid uh, ibn hazm so we are actually chrono chronologically we are actually coming we are discussing people from the nearest hijri nearest to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam nearest to the khilafa rashidun then we are actually now moving slowly right we are coming towards the present right so now we are talking about the scholar of the 5th century of hijri uh, which is uh, probably the uh, 11th century of miladi all right okay so now i was i was telling that um, there was a ghaznavid ghaznavid uh, uh, dynasty um, later the seljuk dynasty came into position so now no need to be confused because i know i'm actually giving you the historical background of every scholar right so i was talking to you about ibn hazm last time i was uh, telling that uh, he 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 might be originally from persia he's a persian but but he 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 lived in cordoba he lived in andalus so i i was telling you about the whole entire background of uh today's what we call uh, today what we call spain last time it was called andalus and uh, before that i was giving you the um picture of khorasan uh, where imam abu ubaid uh, came from right so now 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 i'm talking to you again uh, with regard to i mean again i'm coming back to uh, iran persia but you 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 need to know it's not the same every century got my point uh, so when i told you about khorasan it was the 3rd century the story of 3rd century of khorasan was that so that time it was uh, it was it was consisting consisting of uh, today's afghanistan uh, turkmenistan the entire iran right okay then later it was shrinking and shrinking and shrinking slowly gradually it's, it's not going to happen overnight you know the story it took place like that so slowly gradually shrinking and shrinking today it became uh, a small province called khorasan uh, in today's iran the same thing goes to andalus right the entire um, iberian peninsula called andalus but later over the time over the centuries it's been shrinking and shrinking and became small province today it is called andalus in spain right uh, so uh, so now every century has a different history so you, do, you you don't have to get confused because i was talking to you last time but now it is the 5th century we are in so now Uh, i'm still sticking into abbasid khalifat right so i was talking to you and i was talking to you about abu yusuf i was talking to you about umayyad khalifat uh, umayyad Khal uh, khilafa uh, and then later it was the time when uh, abu ubaid came it was the time of the fall of the umayyad and then the rise of the abbasid right okay good but you see abbasid where in uh, uh, baghdad and before that uh, umayyad uh, umayyad umayyad rulers were in um, in in damascus damascus and then before that it was a medina like khilafa rashidun right you can you can see that from medina to damascus and then from damascus to baghdad and then from baghdad to you know the things are keep on moving and moving right so um uh, so so now I'm, i'm i'm just giving you some dynasties names because since this is also a part of history class i just need to clarify this since i'm giving you um the ghaznavid 
uh, and then I'm going to talk about the Seljuk. Yeah. So this Ghaznavid and Seljuk, uh, they are actually part of Abbasid Caliphate. So so you don't you don't have to think that uh, Abbasid gone and then these people came. No, Abbasid Abbasid were there. Uh, in the Baghdad that time, right? But what happened that uh, the, over the time, um, there were so many new culture coming in. And then, and then you know, uh, people, um, of course, they have converted to Islam. Um, but um, of course, in every area, they, 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 they had, they, they, they had uh, uh, their own leaders to follow. Uh, so, so th those so this is what i'm talking let's say now you move to uh, you move from uh, baghdad kufa to baghdad from baghdad to khurasan then you just go you go further you will have a entire you have the, you, ha you have the huge place huge region it is all entirely called um, uh, ghazna then you have city called ghazna and uh, from ghazna actually you will be going to lahore uh, Lahore, which is today's Pakistan, right? So you see those those areas. Uh, um, so now, now if you look into, if you if you see Iran, uh, it's going to be in our story. Iran is going to be in center. And then you have the uh, uh, you have the incomings uh, from the. If you look at the map uh, on your right side of Iran, uh, you have all those. Um, countries today's like you know uh, Turkmenistan or Kazakhstan or until Russia Afghanistan right and then if you look into the map today if you look into the left side of Iran then you have uh, uh, you have the one side you have Turkey the other side you have Arab countries and all right up still you have Russia and then those things and then if you see now um, I want you to picture it in this way it's coming from you know uh, those Middle Asia we call it today like uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, right? Tajik, uh, I mean uh, there's another one as well. So and to, and then uh, people started coming to uh, Iran today, like today we call those days we call Persia, right? From there they can also move to uh, Turkey. Today, what we see Turkey. So, so why I'm saying, trying to say this, um, you must understand the uh, Perso-Turkish uh, notions. You know, um, this is this is important to understand this entire history. Otherwise, you will be lost. Um, there was, um, uh, you know, because today, uh, if you look into a uh, people of Turkey, the country of Turkey, uh, they called the Turk, you know, Turk people, uh, Turkic. They call it Turkic people. I think you can you can Google it. You will see. Um, not necessary today's Turkey people in Turkey. They are from Turkey, <laughs> right? Kind of confusion because this Turkey, the origin of Turkey, because if you see the countries like Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, you know, those places like Middle Asia, Central Asia, Central Asia, they also speak the similar language what uh, Turkey people are speaking. Uh, so now, now, you know, you might be thinking, yeah, there must be some, there must be, there must be something because um, the origin of today's Turkey language came from those uh, Central Asia, what we call today the entire region, is Islamic region, including Uyghur. Uh, now, now you understand where is Uyghur, right? Uh, see, Uyghur is actually, there is a Chinese name, I don't remember. Um, that is, a, that, that if you look into China, the last province, uh, the last province which is close to India and also Afghanistan and also Iran, the last province it is actually belonged to Uyghur. Uh, it is not actually a part of China before. It was a, a, an independent country, a region. So now you, you look into this Uyghur and then those middle, uh, sorry, Central Asia, including, you know, uh, you have a uh, 
um, uh, all these uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, you know, so many Stan is there, right? So if you look, those are the people are the real Turk people. Uh, so they speak the similar language, you know, is a kind of if I say if I have to say if you see like like, like the similarities found today in Indonesia, Malaysia, and then the uh, 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 local languages in Sabah and Sarawak. And then the local language in Thailand, and then you have Philippines, right? So there is a kind of um, similarity found within these languages, right? So it comes from the same root. So this is this, this, the same example that I can give. Maybe uh, not necessarily it has to be the same example. Maybe they are much closer. Uh, uh, so if you look into those regions that I'm talking with regard to Turkey, today's Turkey language. So um, so now these people who uh, migrated from uh, through through Persia, uh, these Turk people migrated through Persia, and then they went to Turkey, and then they started later who they become Ottoman Empire. So this is all interrelated. This is what I'm trying to tell. Um, one of the reasons why uh, Abbasid Khilafat uh, started falling because of the Mongolians. Right, because Mongolians are the one who close to this region, but they close to Russia, uh, the other side. Right, so they are the one who came and invaded these uh, regions later, which uh, became the reason why Abbasid Khilafat uh, started uh, falling. So that one is a different story. But now I'm sticking into this. So I want to tell you this, uh, including uh, Nizamuddin Tusi. You have these two. Uh, dynasties you need to know Ghaznavid and then you have a uh, Seljuk yeah okay so let me talk about um, how he became prime minister so now uh, his father was um, a tax collector and then later uh, when the uh, when the fa when the uh, governor of his father was murdered uh, then um, they started then the entire family escaped from that place you know because the governor when the governor is uh, murdered, of course, they will be looking for the tax collectors as well. So they, the entire family started uh, uh, escaping from there. And then they entered in the service of Ali ibn Shazan, um, who was then the governor of um, uh, uh, on behalf of Seljuk ruler. You see, the first Seljuk ruler uh, that coming to my mind, his name is Chagari Beg. I think you will be listening the name Beg, 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 right? This is the name Beg, Shagari Beg Dawood. Uh, so this uh, Shagari uh, uh, Beg Dawood, um, he is the one who first appointed um, uh, 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 Nizamuddin, uh, Nizamul Mulk Atusi, uh, Khawaja Abu Ali Hassan. He is the one who first appointed him as a counselor, right? Later, uh, a counselor and also Khatib. Uh, which we call the secretary. Counselor means Mushir. And then you have Kati, which is secretary. Mm, of his son, Alp Arslan. Because Alp Arslan is actually the one uh, became the Seljuk uh, Caliph. Uh, he is the one of the most famous uh, Seljuk Khalifa. Um, so after... Um, uh, uh, so st he started his work as administrator, which is actually counselor. Later, he became joint minister uh, with uh, Amid al Mulk Kunduri, uh, meaning to say that um, this Kunduri was um, uh, 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 was a joint minister. But once the Kunduri passed away, then the joint minister. There is no other joint minister, right? So he was alone the minister. Then he was promoted as a prime minister. So he was the wazir of Seljuk empire uh, in the year of 465. Okay, so as I told you about uh, the conflict between the uh, accepted ideas of, you know, there is a conflict of Islamic policy versus uh, Perso-Turkish uh, notions. Uh, but slowly, uh, you know, um, this uh, Perso-Turkish notions coming to uh, the uh, body uh, politic of the caliphate. So this is the truth. 
Uh, even though they are the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen, but uh, in this region we are talking, we are not talking about Medina or Baghdad, we are talking about this region of, you know, um, this region of Seljuk, which is uh, Persia. Uh, so this Perso-Turkish notion is slowly coming into uh, the body politic of Caliphate. Uh, as I told you last time, uh, earlier just now, from Medina to Damascus, then from Damascus to Baghdad, now it's, it's coming to uh, the Seljuk dynasty. Uh, so, so, so the entire thing slowly and, and thoroughly become uh, Persianized, right? That's what I would say. So now, if you look into those, you know, pictures like you know, with the cap and all, you know, all those, uh, you know, if you see some 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 drawings of a Muslim empire, all this started in these days, uh, and then later, uh, you, you, that's the reason why you will see there are so many uh, similarities between Turkey and Persia in this in this in in, in this in this regard. So, um, in Nizamuddin Tusi was um, uh, um, uh, he was a, 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 a prime minister for thirty years. Oh, so that thirty years actually a kind of a golden age for that region, especially for the Seljuk rule. Um, I tell you what he has done in that uh, 30 years. It was amazing because, uh, see, I gave you the background. Uh, thing, things are becoming uh, Persianized. Things are started already getting, you know, uh, becoming Amir al Mu'minin, become, you know, something. Because uh, I, I know, I, 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 you know already that, yeah, they are actually um, under Abbas. Caliphate, but it's not that you know easy to control all the countries those days. Um, yeah, Abbas said is actually they call them Amir al Mu'minin, and then uh, these kind of uh, there are so many dynasties, so many um, small empires uh, working together with Abbasid. Uh, they will be called Yamin. Yamin Amir al-Mu'minin, Yamin is the right hand or the left hand, you know, these are the small, small Amir al-Mu'minin, they call it. But things were changing because of the culture and all. Um, so, so you see, uh, when culturally things are changing, and then you are also very far from the uh, source of, like, 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 for example, Mecca and Medina is the is the source of Islamic Sharia, right? Now you are very far from Makkah and Medina. It's not that easy. It's, it's, it's quite far, actually. You have to travel like months to reach that place. So when you are far and then you have subject with you, you have people to rule, and then there are culturally things are coming in, and then you won't be able to get so much of knowledge like 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 transferring the knowledge from one region, it is very difficult to get those kind of things. Then you know you have to look after your people by your own on your own. Then um, uh, this this is what the background of uh, Nizam Nizam al Mulk Tusi, uh, but he was able to identify all this because he was living there for so long, and um, and uh, as I told you, he is not actually a, an academic. He is not an academician like, you know, the scholars I told you, like Imam Abu Yusuf or Abu Ubaida, Abu Ubaida or Ibn Hazm. He is not like them. He is actually a political administrator. Uh, he was a political administrator who has a very good knowledge of Sharia and everything. Um, so, so he's, uh, if I have to tell you, you know, um, he is, he, he, he started writing this, uh, book uh, uh, Siyasat Nama. Not necessarily he sit down and wrote. He was giving his experiences. So everything. So now this book has become like a guide for many and many administrators and also including the including the uh, kings. So now uh, 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 you, you you won't see you 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 won't see in his book because I was reading his book last night and then I saw that. You, you, I didn't see the arguments like, you know, what Abu Yusuf and uh, Ibn Hazm or Abu Ubaid is bringing, for example, this scholar saying this, and then this is the Adillah, this is the evidences, and then I'm saying this. No, it's not like that, actually. Uh, you will be seeing it is actually a kind of wisdom. Uh, he is saying, how do you deal with people when you have this kind of situation? Uh, how do you... Um, uh, how do you how do you cater people when they need something? 
there are so many stories he is actually uh, amazing uh, experiences you know it's like um, to me you know this is what came to my mind if um, if someone ask uh, uh, dr tun uh, to tun m dr tun m to write uh, something of you know you see you see that the man i'm talking to you is has a vast was experience right so so whether he's right or wrong but he got experiences and all so now he can sit down and tell his entire entire story of how he has to tackle the issues in malaysia uh, and then especially the neighboring countries and all right so it is something like that so the book is amazing uh, siyasat nama um, he is uh, telling his own experiences um so let us talk about um uh, his 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 idea of you know i mean his 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 contribution other than the siyasat nama uh, yeah siyasat nama actually came later his is as his book but before that uh, let me give you what he has done during his uh, prime ministership um he organized a system of education i think this is what quite important to me i think um, uh, this is what actually i wanted to tell you later but let me just give you then some examples now uh, you know um, um, uh, you are living in a country which is very far from makkah and medina and then you don't have much uh, you know uh, 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 much um, intellectual discussions like uh, like in baghdad and kufa or basra right so so you have to you know uh, start a way of you know uh, people coming and students are coming and you know this is something new maybe some scholars might be saying that time that this is bid'ah what i mean that opening the education institute this is the first time he is actually doing in that region um look what happened um when he was doing it do you know uh, who who were the teachers that he hired amazing he hired uh, imam ghazali to come and teach imam al haramain of naishabur uh, and then imam shashi the one who wrote usul al fiqh uh, shashi uh, and then um, shirazi subhanallah the people from baghdad people uh, from herat people from nishapur you know coming and they are the one who he he hired them asking them to he opened the institution and then he bring he brought so many students and then and then these are the lecturers are came and then there are so many other not only um, he was also a um, great impact to other uh, administrators other ministers because those days if you are a minister you will be given a name Uh, as i as, as i told you nizam al nizam al mulk was not his name uh, khwaja abu ali hasan was his name right uh, so um, so there were so many uh, names for other administrators for example there was a tajul mulk right there was um, uh, uh, there 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 were so many for example uh, there were uh, hikmat uh, hakimul mulk tajul mulk let me give you some names here okay the, the names are coming back i will i will get back to you so uh, if you see um, there were um, as i told you uh, there were so many other institute also started in isfahan and murf uh, which possessed 10 public libraries uh, beside these um, uh, there were so many other uh, institutes that opened in samarkand right balkh damascus ghazni and lahore remember lahore lahore is today is actually pakistan so he is the first person who uh, administered and uh, started institute in lahore and remember when it was in lahore then it was quite easy to go to the entire subcontinent as well and then including the southeast asia everything comes from there right from lahore um there were so many uh, al almost um, in his time he was he was able to produce 170 eminent scholars of that time right it is not only about um, uh, opening education uh, he was also was able to open uh, disbursement of scholarship supplies of books including lodging including boarding 
any other necessity let's say you want to learn a knowledge if you have the intention so he he took all the all the responsibilities right um this is all in academy i mean in the educational sector uh, in economic sector subhanallah he has done so many other things as well for example he brought um, roads infrastructural and economic development of the empire right land policy is very important in his uh, in his uh, dynasty seljuk dynasty which we will discuss later yeah so until he was able to get a title called atabek uh, atabek is actually the word of turk turkish language i think ata ata means uh, father right atabek is father lord uh, he was uh, even radi ami radi amir mu'minin so these were the uh, nobel prizes like today what we call it prizes those days they were awards given by abbasid abbasid khalifat and also seljuk khilafat uh, they were able to give these kind of awards to him okay now the second part of his uh, of the discussion today that we are going to talk about his work his work is actually um uh, he wrote uh, there were some others some other work other than siyasatnama there is one which is a dastur al wuzara and then there's another one is a safar nama the book of travels but uh, but uh, but but um uh yeah the other books also available but it is not necessarily he is the one who wrote by himself but siyasat nama he narrated his own experiences and he has someone to write in front of him that is what siyasat nama um not only that um uh, siyasat nama it was the requirement it's, it was the request of um of uh, uh, of the of the caliphate of that time um uh, so so there were uh, many uh, yeah these are the names i wanted to tell you the the different administrators has a different different names one of them called sharaful mulk tajul mulk majdul mulk there are so many mulks uh, only nizamul mulks uh, siyasat nama was approved uh, by the uh, seljuk dynasty uh, it this book has a uh, 50 chapters Uh, spreading over the task of and identifying the uh, so many like for example the factor of political success the factor of um, uh, 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 royal prerogatives the the factor of duties along with administrations there are so many varieties of chapters as available um this in short if i if i have to tell you this book is actually uh, it's a detailed book is a detail uh, of the plan of running a government if you want to run a successful government this is your guide um uh, this book also um uh, talks about domestic affairs is an expression of uh, uh, realistic political theory um as of course uh, you will see the development of muslim polity reached in the 5th century i think this book is amazing of that time all right so now, now let's talk about his um thought yeah this position we talked about it okay his economic ideas um you know um his thought especially uh, you know, as i told you he was not a pure academician he was not a pure um uh, a, a pure um, a knowledge seeker he was also a politician at the same time administrator so uh, so mostly his economic thought uh comes together with political thought so so even for uh, politics especially uh, we have a department of political science uh, he is the one of the great uh, reference for political science as well as well as economic economics so um most of that uh, most of his uh, 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 his contribution uh, comes together with the how to how to implement these economic ideas in political in the political framework so that is something new something that we something uh, something new people for like, i mean something new pe- for people like us because we only discuss uh, the 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 academic point of view right so so this book is good for us to also look into political point of view um yes um uh, his economic idea for example uh, the concept of milla uh and um, the state as a moral institutions he was he wanted to he he wanted to bring uh, religious activities and also the uh, mundane functions together 
the non-religious activities. He wanted to bring uh, as one. Uh, that was his actually. Uh, uh, actually, that was his idea of you know bringing things together, and uh, that that's that's brought him to the principle of uh, maslaha. Um, this principle of maslaha uh, uh, came into because uh, you know um, um, maslaha is uh, is is something. Most probably, uh, if I have to talk to you about Imam Malik, uh, Imam Malik was very, very I mean, uh, he was he, he was well established in the concept of al-maslaha. That's the reason why uh, most of the Maliki scholars, they talk about maqas sharia is because of the maslaha. Right? So he was very much uh, into this uh, concept of maslaha in administration. Uh, he used uh, the administration in order to help people, in order to bring the good things among people, uh, and also uh, 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 eliminate the conflict among people. Mm. So now, uh, if there is um, anything, for example, uh, short-term gains, he always, uh, you know, um, um, he always, you know, he never go for the short-term gains because he used to sacrifice the short-term gains in order to get the long-term gain that was the idea and then um, his uh, idea of safeguarding welfare productivity and efficiency um, so this is something you know um, uh, uh, his, 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 his idea uh, there was actually a story uh, you know uh, there was a story like once there was a um, um, uh, uh, fight between uh, al Parsalan and his uh, own relative brother or cousin brother, his name is Kutlumush. Kutlumush, <laughs> the name. Um, so, um, uh, of course, um, you know, as a political uh, administrator, uh, time to time he also need, need he, uh, he was, he believed in welfare and uh, efficiency of the Khilafah. Um, so what happened that um, his uh, this Kultumush wanted to come and fight against uh, uh, Al Parsalan. Al Parsalan is the uh, Khalifa of uh, Nizam al Mulk. Yeah, he is the leader of Nizam al Mulk. He is the Prime Minister of uh, is a Prime Minister of Al Parsalan. Nizam al Mulk was Prime Minister of Al Parsalan. So remember the name. Uh, so the well Kultumush wanted to fight with him. Um, Kultumush actually. Um, uh, made impossible to reach him by putting some water surrounding him uh, and uh, al parsalan almost uh, thought it is impossible to go and reach him because there were many there were water in the valley uh, so when there was a water he was afraid to go but but you know um uh, uh, the 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 uh, this Nizam al Mulk was uh, going and telling him that uh, there is nothing to fear because I have people who are actually very good in uh, 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 targeting because they never miss any targets. I have recruited soldiers who shots never miss the targets. At the same time, I have also people who secured loyalty of pious pious reciters because these are the ulama reciters. I will make them pray at the same time while the soldiers are um, fighting. So you look at it. This is what actually Prophet ﷺ did. You know, when there was a, a, a war as against of kuffar, and he will be asking some people to go and ask Allah help, Allah's help. Istainu bi sabri wa salah, right? So there will be a group of people who is praying to Allah, asking Allah to help, and then there's a group of people going and fighting. I think he followed the same thing. <clears throat> about the welfare, productivity, and efficiency, and then the uh, uh, national, and then the uh, uh, the stability. Of course, the national stability, because uh, he was thinking that uh, there must be free kitchens. See, this is this is the idea today. Uh, if someone brings this idea, we are thinking that these are the new ideas. But these ideas, thousand years old, you know, opening free kitchens. Yeah, he was saying food must be plentiful and the state should be organizing free kitchens for the needy and the poor. The agricultural produce should be kept up so that there is no shortage of the food stuff. So this is what we call national stability that he was uh, talking about. Then the uh, cautious economic measurement. Um, uh, you know, um, yes, uh, he was actually um, um, 
uh, because there was a time uh, when uh, the uh, uh, Malik Shah, Malik Shah is actually who came, who became the uh, Khalifa after uh, after Al Parsalan. Yeah. Uh, so Malik Shah was thinking to reduce the army, but he said, "You don't have to reduce the army. If you reduce the army, then um, your 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 country will will, will reduce the strength, and uh, and then." Uh, and then uh, you know you shouldn't be thinking the short term gain because he was thinking uh, because he was not getting the uh, taxes enough taxes to su su survive but he said that if you reduce you will you will be getting you won't if you, by reducing you are not going to get but by reducing uh, you will be uh, reducing your strength and again you will be reducing the taxes because the army is the one who is going to bring more taxes because if the army is there the army will be because this is what comes in the land policy we will talk about it how army is actually contributing to the uh, government's taxes tax system they are the reason why taxes were increasing uh, it comes to the land policy today we don't have that but those days if you are the fighter you will be given the land it's called feudalism today we call it feudalism yeah uh, so you will you will be given the uh, land and then from the land uh, you have to ask people to work in the land or maybe the land owners uh, they will be working in that land but you will be collecting the taxes and then you will paying to the government so that kind of thing we will discuss it later after this yeah so then um also um Okay, uh, and then the optimal uh, employment uh, labor. Yeah, so um, yes, uh, uh, because uh, this is something I uh, see. See, when he was talking about the uh, army, army, he, he said we should keep the army. But at the same time, the public servants or, you know, the multiplication of the post, he had a different idea of, you know, uh, not increasing the post. I, uh, unless you change the post, you know this is something amazing. I think uh, even 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 today also we are following this. You don't keep someone in the post for too long until he become rooted, and then you know he become uh, what what we call it. Uh, yeah, you know he won't be product enough. He, he let's say someone is working in an office for thirty years in the same office. His productivity will be no more. So you will be, you should be changing like three years, four years, five years, changing to the different office. The different people will come to your office. You know, this kind of things still we are doing in the uh, in the, in UIE. For example, if a, if a staff working in the general office, they will be moving to the research office. They will be moving into department office. You know, it's like kind of things changing and changing. Even they will be promoted to the different offices. Yeah, last time it they will be administrator, then becomes. Um, uh, assistant directors then become uh, senior assistant directors then become deputy director you know these are the things are very always go changing the offices so he started it actually thousand years ago right socio-economic equality uh, yes of course he wanted to see everybody is uh, equal there is no differences because of the race because of the uh, accepting of Islam you know there shouldn't be any differences and then the just tax system, you know, this is something amazing um, because when um, this is the story behind it, because when uh, Al Parsalan uh, wanted to uh, go against uh, Byzantine Empire, he actually needed more tax. He needed more money. So he asked, uh, he wanted actually, he wanted to increase the tax. But the problem that time, the, there was a plague in Merv. So people started dying. Then, you know what happened? He said, uh, he came to see al -Parslan. He said, it is not actually, uh, he said, you know, um, uh, 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 he said that respectfully, he replied that uh, only justice and benevolence could eradicate the plague. Now you have the problem plague and then you come and then you wanted to increase the tax. It will, it will actually, um, uh, it will actually uh, it, it it will worsen the situation because this story is something that I can relate the story to 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 what we are facing today because of the COVID nineteen challenges. Um, <clears throat> he told a great idea. He told uh, Al Barsalan, "What you should do, you should be doing like a king. There was a king, 
and he asked uh, uh, administrators to go and look for the treasury and then everybody came back and then everybody said this is what uh, everybody came alone and then they said this is the this is the number of treasury we have this is the measurement of the treasury this amount of uh, gold silver we have blah 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 okay right okay then you know what the king did the king uh, of course the king thought the king got the uh, information from the uh, treasury that there are something good something not good not enough but at the end of the day he called everybody all the administrators and then he made announcement he said uh, i talked to the treasury i checked the treasury and it's very good our treasury is good we have full enough efficient uh, efficient uh, supplies for the for the next years so do not up, uh, get uh, do not get uh, in, do not increase taxes to the people uh, let them enjoy their life uh, if they have any problem we are here to help you see you see now uh, uh, this kind of hope good word uh, spread like a fire to the people and then the people started believe in king and also people started believe in the country and then even the the disease like plague actually gone uh, the, the people, he, even they had a difficulties, but they had a hope that, yeah, the king is good. The king is wealthy. The king can uh, handle this issue. Uh, when people had that hope, you see, it, it's a big scale, by the way, talking. So now, uh, because of that, the, the entire nation came into prosper, um, uh, prosperous, they came into a happy situation. So I just want to, you know, uh, bring this... Um, uh, examples of what we are having today uh, you see for example country like malaysia was giving the hope you know they are in control especially the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic you know this this you see you you look at other countries how they are having problems while well, mashallah our countries are safe that's because of the country is actually uh, not actually threatening you there are so many countries i can give you i don't want to give the name Every single day you open the news channel, they are threatening you. They say people are dying today rather than, you know, they are supposed to highlight how many people are recovering rather than giving you the information of recovering. The recovering message is slow, small, you can't even read. But the affecting, uh, affected in uh, coronavirus cases, then they are putting it up and then they are keep every day they keep you threatening and threatening you don't even want to go outside and you don't want to be happy and then what happened is a distress is a kind of you know um a stress that you are having and because of that the, the productivity is gone yeah this is a good story that i just want to uh, uh i just want to refer to what we are going to uh, refer to what we are have what what is happening with us today so land policies i just want to finish with these land policies i think land policies um something amazing that he has done is a huge uh, chapter by the way uh what he was doing is actually is called feudalism uh, what was the practice and what he did let me just give you uh, some idea about these two three slides um Actually, what was happening that um, there is a king, all right? There is a Khalifa. Then the Khalifa will have the army, and then the army will go and fight for the king, for the country. Then they will be uh, uh, they will be conquering the lands. The, they will be expanding the territories. In return, you know, we talked about it earlier. In return, they will be getting the land. And you know the people, they have to pay haraj. If the non-Muslim, they have to pay haraj together with the jizya, right? Everything is there. Okay, now, now, what is the role of um, this property? The one, uh, what happened? That there, there, there was a system called iqta, right? Iqta, iqta dari. Uh, we can actually call it today's feudalism. Feudalism. What is feudalism? It is actually something that um, you 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 conquer the land and then you you keep the land in your control and then you are make people work for you in that land. Even the own the own the owner of the land, the previous owner of the land, today he will be become like a worker in his own land. You see, uh, so the one who conquer the land, he will be controlling everything. So now, um, those days there was a system. Uh, for the soldiers, especially the one who fight, 
the system was there. There was a system iqta. Uh, the government, the Khalifa, the Khalifa will 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 distribute uh, some of the lands to the, some of the soldiers. Um, but the soldiers, the army officers, there are different different you know stages and control. So they go to those places, and then uh, they will collect the taxes. Most of the time, they will be collecting like you know they are the owner of the. Um, uh, land and then the real owner is working like for them right so what uh, he wanted to what what he actually he brought the new uh, system he's saying that um, first of all this uh, or this 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 feudalism must be must be abolished meaning to say that uh, it's not completely abolished it has to be regulated okay let me say regulated regulated means uh, every two two to three years these offices must be changed number one right you you conquer a land and then the government giving you a land and there is a people who, who who is the real owner of the land they must be the real owner of the land they must be paying you the taxes just for the sake of you are providing the security so now last time <clears throat> these offices were the uh, these offices controlling those people now he he, he brought the system the real owners, the real uh, land owners should be controlling the officers uh, because they will be demanding the protection. Um, uh, and then uh, because they are giving the protection, so they are paying something. This is what the system, I'm telling you on what basis actually Nizam al-Mulk actually suggested this. This is very important because uh, Nizam al-Mulk cannot simply come and say because the army officers will not you know, listen to listen to him. Uh, the reason why uh, there is a reason he brought he he told the Khalifa saying that you know um, uh, there is a good reason behind it why because the subject they are the subject of the king of the Khalifa they are not the subject of the army uh, so now he wanted to make clear to Al Parsalan also Malik Shah saying that uh, as long as you keep my system this system that I'm saying the people will be having the good thought about the king. The people will be, um, the subject will be very honest to the king and then they will be uh, working hard for you uh, rather than the army officers. So so, so the idea was very good to the Malik Shah and also al So they actually agreed to the system. This is what actually there are there are many, you can actually go through and read. I think if you don't understand some of it, you can return back to me inshallah, right? Okay. And then the attributes of head state, how as head of state should be, uh, appearances, pleasing disposition, integrity, manliness, he talks about all those things. And then control of public servant. If you're a public servant, what are the things you have to do? You couldn't be, shouldn't be misappropriating the funds. You cannot abuse of power, authority, etc. These are the things. And then also he talks about the attributes of the muhtasib. The muhtasib is the person in charge of those, you know, activities. And then uh, he also started, you know, this is this is this thing happened thousand years ago. If you have any complaint, you can come, you can make complaint court. So he actually introduced this. Izam al Mulk was very much impressed and partly inspired by the ancient Persian king's methods of administration of justice. Uh, so if you have problem, um, like for for example, in every place they call ombudsman. They call it something like that because um, this he will be. He is a person who comes from the government. Let's say you have any issues uh, in your company, in your factory, you can actually approach him to complain. The same thing if you have a problem, you can go to the mahkama and then you can start complaining in mahkama. This is the system that he introduced uh, in uh, uh, Seljuk dynasty, by the way. Um, and then of course there is a. Um, uh, this is the last. Uh, this, is, this is the last uh, slide. There is a misconception of you know Nizam al Mulk as a Persian nationalist. Actually, not necessary. He is to be a Persian nationalist, uh, but most of his uh, work has a impact of Persian administration because you see he lived there for long. He, 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 uh, around 75, 76 years around he was living, uh, but he had vast experience hearing so many stories to, from people. Hearing so many, you know, um, things. I mean, uh, what I mean. Um, uh, the, the, so you see, wh whatever these ideas that he is bringing, uh, not necessarily it has to be uh, coming from Baghdad or Medina. Uh, you see, this is. I mean, this is what actually we should. Uh, we, sh we, we, we should. We, we should follow. You know. Um, 
your place has your own history right uh, let's say i'm indian i have my own history of indian uh, rulings you have the own history of malay rule rulers and all so if there is a good thing for sure we have to we have to follow that we we shouldn't be thinking okay i have to follow only what um, uh, islamic khalifa is were doing if there is because uh, because the, yeah they are the very good uh, khalifa of course there is no doubt but according to the nature of the people they have reacted uh, so who is who is the person who has reacted according to your nature is actually your own king so this is what actually uh, nizam al mulk tus was able to balance it he was actually following of course the islamic sharia but on the nature of the uh, persia so whatever the right thing to do according to quran and sunnah he took that so that's the reason why you will see all these new systems actually coming from persian persian uh, empires so there are so many persian empires even though they were non muslims yeah not necessarily they have to be muslim so we need to uh, we need to see the good things from our non muslims uh, scholars as well we have to look into the good things especially the from non muslim rulers if there is a good thing take it and use it uh, that will be uh, that that will that, that that will show you uh, what is the good governance is what is the good governance so i think uh, that's all uh, what i what i can give you from uh, nizam al mulk uh, to see all right